a healthy functioning democracy. That'd be pretty cool to have, wouldn't it? Because we are sorely lacking in that particular department right now. Now, one of the pillars of a proper functioning democracy would be a truly independent media which arms citizens with the facts about the world in which they live so they can make informed decisions about the future of their country, or indeed their local community, for that matter. It would be about holding the powerful to account without fear or favour. Now, we just don't have that. Sorry, guys, to be brutal about it, but it's just not, not currently on offer. Maybe we'll be lucky. Christmas this year, Santa will deliver us with a truly independent media. Now, let's just hear from Hugh Grant, uh, who's, of course, a celebrated British actor. Um, he was in the United States on a show, and he's been an active campaign on media issues for a long time. I think he had some important things to say. Newspapers need power, a lot of power, because yeah. they're really important to democracy. But, he said pompously, with power comes responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And in Britain, it is a kind of uniquely UK problem. Yeah. Uh, there's no responsibility, and these big newspaper owners largely non-taxpaying newspaper owners mm -hmm. are living above the law and invading the, the the privacy of people whose kids have been killed in a road accident or whatever yeah. to get the sensational mm -hmm. article and no one dares to take them on in britain because they're so scared of them mm -hmm. yeah. especially the politicians and that's why politicians really in my country are, are chosen by the press our prime minister is largely chosen by dint of how much he's sucked up to the uh, yeah. To the, to, to the newspaper barons. So that's what my campaign is, is yeah. about. Do you think that Brexit has ruined your country? <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> said with a smile. Yeah. And actually, now the majority of Brits do as well, yeah. I think. That we'll so so maybe it it'll get fixed. I hope yeah, so. Yeah, the Europeans may not want us back. They may say, well, you know, choose one and stick yeah. to it. Um, <laughs> it's also very pricey for them to get back into. Yeah, but yeah, you used to have a discount. To. Yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've lost our discount. Points were made by Hugh there, I think it's fair to say. It's had a bit over-familiar using his first name, but I don't know. I feel like Hugh Grant's been a very big part of our lives. So it kind of feels like we've, we've got to know him. And he's got, I think... I think some intelligent things to say. I don't always agree with him. I, you know, I'm not sure he's a radical lefty socialist for a start. But he has raised some really, really important issues about the media in his campaigning. Now, he's right, incidentally, that the right-wing media basically behave like gangsters. Anyone seen as a threat to their political or commercial objectives or tries to stand up to them in any way risks getting trashed, demonised, or indeed their lives being turned over. That's whether they're celebrities or they're politicians. Now, people go, well, come on now, Owen. We've got a free press. They do what they want. They're not run by the government. And that's true. We're not North Korea. Not an ambitious place to start. Um, I often say that, but it's true. I mean, it's just, you know, this idea of the definition of a free press is as long as the government don't directly run the media, you know, I think it's such a low bar. Because in practice, media outlets in Britain and elsewhere are playthings of this tiny group of often very wealthy, extremely wealthy oligarchs, Rupert Murdoch is the obvious one, but, I don't know, Michael Bloomberg. Or now the late Silvio Berlusconi running up as Prime Minister of Italy whilst running much of the media in the country. The Barclay Brothers, for example. Now, in the US alone, just eight media corporations own 788 TV stations. And obviously, owning, kind of, having such a near monopoly, or such a large stranglehold over the means of information... That is a way of buying and gaining political influence. I mean, actually, it's interesting because owning a newspaper does get direct access to politicians. Between 1988 and 2012, Murdoch met with senior politicians in Britain at least 113 times. Even after the phone hacking scandal, um, so in one nine-month period alone, um, Murdoch met ministers or advisors at least 22 times. When Trump was president, Murdoch was ringing him on once a week. It's ridiculous. Now, obviously, these are rich people. And they want to make money. And they are part of a status quo, which they want to defend. So obviously they've got a vested interest in opposing policies, movements, politicians. Even if they kind of modestly want to challenge the status quo from which these oligarchs um, benefit. Um, you know, in which they thrive. So that's why politicians and movements who challenge it are often just crushed by media outlets. So even the when you get ideas and beliefs which are quite widespread in society, I mean, you know, the polling shows that in the US, 57% uh, of self-declared Democrats, tens of millions of Americans, have a positive view of socialism. 
but it's not like you get a load of socialist pundits reflecting those views on US TV channels or as columnists. Um, I mean, you know, in Britain, overwhelming or well, very large majorities of people support nationalisation of energy, of rail, of water, higher taxes on the rich. But how many newspapers, how many newspaper columnists are there advocating for those sorts of ideas, even though they're so widespread? Now, obviously, just because they're widespread in public opinion doesn't mean newspapers want to give them a platform because they are threatened by those ideas. Of course, that's the whole point. Um, now, you also, I mean, well, I'm always interested in this kind of like, the, 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 how often the, there's a blurring of lines between those in power and many, or too, all too many senior journalists. I'm not just thinking of like, I've no examples of journalists being like godparents to the children of politicians or going on holiday or having sex with each other. Um, but also, I mean, just, you know, you had one example. James Forsyth was the political editor of The Spectator magazine, a weekly columnist for The Times and formerly The Sun and The Mail on Sunday. Best man at his wedding was the now Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, um, who was then who became, well, he was Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer, of course, under, under Boris Johnson. The godparents to each other's kids. Um, his wife, Allegra Stratton, was a former BBC and ITV journalist, former Guardian columnist, I should say, not Guardian columnist, Guardian reporter. Um, now, she became the spin doctor for Rishi Sunak and then Boris Johnson before her downfall during the whole Partygate saga. Um, well, he ended up getting a job. He let it now as, as a speechwriter for Rishi Sunak. It's ludicrous. I mean, it's we might even talk about the BBC, which I've talked about at length before, where, you know, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, David Cameron, and Rishi Sunak have all hired senior BBC uh, figures as their spin doctors. I forgot to mention George Osborne also did that. Um, so, you know, it's that closeness often. Um, and, you know, you can see it in Britain the editorial stance of most newspapers is very right-wing in an aggressive way. They aggressively support the Conservative Party, particularly in elections, um, and, you know, use that to try and monster uh, Labour. Um, you know, under Tony Blair, a part of the Faustian pact made with the establishment and to get the support, for example, Rupert Murdoch, was obviously not threatening the status quo and the, the establishment, which is what, you know, Tony Blair stuck to his... Stuck to that end of the bargain. Um, it's interesting too about the the social background of journalists because in Britain it's the second most socially exclusive um, profession after being a doctor. That was a government study that found that. Um, the number of people of colour working in journalism, 8% compared to 12% of the wider labour force. Working re class representation uh, fell to a record low. Um, recently, astonishing 84% of journalists from higher socioeconomic backgrounds, 16% from low or middle. Um, and then you've got, you know, lack of female representation, particularly as you get to more senior positions. But, you know, one study found a quarter of British front page stories in a randomly selected time frame were written by, by women, so three quarters by men. There's also, you know, the fact that newspaper advertising revenues and collapse has thrown traditional media outlets into crisis. Um, and that's men with more people wanting to be journalists than ever, um, that precariousness, but also ambition, is exploited by media outlets because journalists are scared that if they rock the boat, then they'll get fired, and that's the end of their career in the media. And that gives a whip hand to, to those at the top. Um, I just think it's what, you know, examples of Richard Pepio, who worked for the Daily Star, who sensationally resigned many years ago, alleging that he was made to peddle anti-Muslim stories based on uh, untruths. Um, and, and it's the crisis of the media is making it hard another way. I mean, you know, newspaper employment has fallen steeply. Um, in Britain, 228 local newspapers closed between 2005 and 2018. The number of regional journalists is um, estimated to a half around 6,500. That stops working class people becoming journalists because they often get experience on local newspapers and climb the ladder. Unpaid internships is another thing that makes it financially prohibitive because often journalists um, get their foot in the door through unpaid internships often because they're friends or relatives of people who already work in the media. Um, but also, you have to work for free uh, to get that experience on your CV to get into the media. But obviously, most people can't afford to do that, to live for free in London, often. Or to do expensive postgraduate qualifications in journalism, which most people can't afford to do. Um, but it's interesting, as newspaper, as you get, the, you know, you get this people from gilded backgrounds as journalists, relatively speaking. Um, but as also the number of journalists declines, 
Um, PR, public relations, increases. What PR does is manipulate public perceptions and attitudes on behalf of wealthy clients. It's exploded in size. So the financial worth of PR um, jumped from 2013 from 9.6 billion to 14 billion three years later. And the workforce in that period went from 62,000 to 86,000. So you have fewer journalists and fewer PR people who are kind of trying to manipulate public opinion. These are just some examples of how the media is broken how it is often the plaything of very rich media moguls, um, how it's journalists come from disproportionately privileged backgrounds. There's a lack of representation for voices in society who often suffer the worst forms of oppression um, in society. Um, and they're often scapegoated where you get media outlets punching down, attacking refugees, Muslims, migrants, trans people, saying complete untruths about them. Um, and then when they're forced to do a correction, it's on page 53 you know, right at the bottom so no one can see it when it was on the front page or whatever. Um, and you get the rise of public relations and the decline of the number of journalists. So you get end up off copy regurgitating what PR wants you to hear on behalf of wealthy clients. These are some examples. It's not a functioning democracy. So I'm glad Hugh Grant is fostering and supporting this debate. And I want to hear more. I want to hear your thoughts, though, as ever. Do leave them in the comments. I always read the comments. So do leave your comments, your thoughts. Um, do like and subscribe. Do support us on patreon.com forward slash ownjoes84. Um, and I'll see you in a bit. Lots of love.